Barbara, what's the most popular American home garden vegetable, according to the polls? Tomatoes. No. Nope. Well, what is it then? Tomatoes. Well, there's one thing we can all agree on. Nothing quite compares to fresh, vine-ripened, tasty tomatoes from your own garden. I'm Barbara Damron. And I'm Elliot Coleman. Stay with us for the next half hour, and we'll try and teach you all we know about growing tomatoes. He means tomatoes. On Gardening Naturally. This is the reward that every tomato grower looks forward to. But to start at the beginning, we really have to go back about six months. In order to grow those wonderful tomato crops, you need to start with good plants. And before you have plants, you need to plant some seeds. But before you can plant seeds, you need to make some choices. Now, when I say choices, I mean a lot. In this garden seed inventory from the Seed Savers Exchange, which is a group of amateurs that save old-time varieties of seeds, there are 40 pages devoted to seeds of tomato varieties that people have saved. And in this book, Cornucopia, which is a source book of every seed sold in the U.S. by seed catalogs, there are 233 tomato varieties described. Now, these vary from large to small, from early to late, from red to yellow to striped, every possible combination. So how do you decide which ones you're going to grow? Well, when I'm looking through a seed catalog, the first word I look for is flavor. If it tastes good, that's the tomato I want. And most seed catalogs, they're pretty honest. This will say exceptional flavor, great flavor, good flavor. Now, I never let myself be fooled by a colorful description, something that says big red market tomato. Now, that might sound exciting, but that's probably the one that's designed to be grown by a large commercial grower who's going to ship it, and that isn't going to be the best tasting one to grow in your home garden. So, I've gone through all these different choices, and I've made my decision, and every year I guarantee myself I'm going to get down to just two or three tomato varieties. Well, I'm embarrassed to admit that there's about 15 packets here between last year and this year, and I did get down to eight varieties for this year, at least until a package arrived from a friend in Italy. Yeah, there's hundreds of different ones, other parts of the world too, offering me two wonderful new varieties. In fact, one that is supposed to be absolutely delicious, even though it still has green shoulders when it's ripe, something one normally wouldn't think of. Well, I've made my decision and I'm ready to plant my seeds, and the way I prefer to plant them is in soil blocks. In a previous show, we, we demonstrated the specifics of making soil blocks, but let me just reiterate here. I like them because they're space-saving, they're money-saving, I don't have to buy plastic pots, and they grow an exceptional tomato plant. They're space-saving because we start with small ones, just three-quarter inch cubes made by a little cuber blocker. And when I'm ready to plant, I'll sprinkle my tomato seeds, on a little plate like this where I can see them, moisten the end of a dowel, and that's just enough friction to pick the seeds up one by one and put them in the center of each of those little blocks. The advantage of this is that each tomato plant then has its own little block to grow in, and when I move it on, as I will to a larger size growing area, I no longer have to disturb the roots as I would if I were digging it out of some soil. Now, the next step is to move it to a larger growing area. This is a two-inch block made by this blocker here with a cubic hole in the top of it. And that means that I can just take my little tomato seedling and move it on very quickly. Now, these are all nice little seedlings, but I prefer not to let them get this old before I move them on. I prefer to transplant them when they've just germinated. Then there's less root disturbance, and I find that I get a much better plant later on, the less stress the little seedling goes through. Once those have grown and matured, we now have nice little plants like this. 
And there's one more step to go. The secret in growing a really good tomato plant to put in the garden is to grow it in a big pot so it has lots of room. Well, there's also a big block. That's made with this blocker here. It also has a hole in the top, just the right size for one of these to fit into, and so I can pick this up and move it on at the right stage. This little seedling was just germinated. That's maybe eight days old. This one here has been around for maybe oh, three weeks, and now it'll go on for another three weeks till it's six weeks old in here, and then it'll look like one of these plants here. Now, I prefer to put a six-week-old transplant into the garden. Any bigger than that, the tall, spindly ones are the ones that already have blossoms or even are starting to make fruit, are under much more stress when you put them out and won't do as well over the long run. You take a healthy, vigorous, six-week-old plant and put it out, ah, now you've got a plant that's going somewhere. Now, if you don't have access to soil block equipment or you prefer to grow in pots, the same rule still applies. You want your plant to have lots of root room, and therefore you want to put it into a large pot for the last three weeks of its growth before it goes in the garden, either a round one like this or a square one like this. Now, there is a way to treat a pot so it will grow a better plant, an awful lot like a soil block does. I take a saw and I cut slits in this pot, and what that does is get air around the root system so the roots, when they're growing, meet that air and therefore cannot circle around the pot. The advantage of that is that the roots then stay at the edge of the soil in here rather than circling, and when you put it in the ground, just like the roots of a soil block, they're ready to shoot out into the soil and get established well. Whether you're growing in pots or in soil blocks, remember, the key is to give the plant plenty of good, fertile root room. I'm out here in the garden having a tea party, but in this case, the tea isn't for me, it's for my tomato plants. This is manure tea, or compost tea. I made sure that the manure I used was well composted. I could also have used a pure plant-based compost. And I have mixed one part of manure to about four parts of water in here. And what I want are the water-soluble fractions of that that I can then use to give a pick-me-up to the tomato plants. It's also valuable for any plant in the garden. And to do that, I would just open the jar and pour a cup or so right around the base of the plant, and then move on to the next plant. But this product also has other fascinating qualities. Research in Europe has shown that a manure tea, if it is made right in that same ratio, about four to one, and if it's aged for seven days, has incredible preventive properties against the diseases that tomato plants get, especially the blights. And in order to do that, I have filtered it here through a cheesecloth, just to make sure I had a clean sample. It wasn't going to clog this little sprayer. And the technique that's being used is merely then to spray it on the leaves, as if I were using any other product. And what happens, and this is what's fascinating about the research, is spraying on the liquid tea, compost, manure tea, whatever you want to call it, seems to induce resistance in the plant against the leaf diseases, the same way putting compost in your soil makes the whole plant more vigorous and, and healthier. Now, remember, about one part compost or manure to four parts water, and let it set for seven days. They were very specific on this in the research that that seven-day sitting seemed to be the key to making it as effective as possible. If there's anything all gardeners can agree on, it's the desire to have tomatoes ripen as early as possible. And I'm no different from anyone else. And so I set out my earliest young plants in a cold frame. Now, cold frame is just this set of boards around the side with a glass cover on top that keeps it extra warm in here. And when I put my little plants in there, an interesting thing happens. Because the soil is warm and it's early in the season, they are able to send their roots way out into the soil and establish an enormous root system before they even begin to grow enough to touch the bottom of that glass. Now, if I've set them out early enough so they are pushing the bottom of the glass and it isn't safe to take it off yet, I will just set another strip of wood around here, say two by fours, same size as this, and then raise the glass up another four inches, let them come a little higher. But that's usually enough because I've usually only put them in here about a month before the safe outdoor date, and then I can take off the glass. 
Now, because they establish that incredible root system, they are healthy and ready to grow up and be really vigorous from this early start. I put two different varieties in here, though. I put an early, like this early Cascade, but I also put a late delicious variety, like Carmelo on the back. And the reason I do that is that gets me the delicious late variety about a month earlier than I would get it if I set them out of doors. I'm getting them early, and I'm getting them delicious. Who could ask for anything better than that? Now, the other technique that I would use if I didn't have cold frames would be to warm the soil before I put my outdoor tomatoes in. And what I've done for these is to cover the soil with a black plastic like this that warms the soil extra early. This happens to be called IRT plastic for infrared transmitting plastic. It lets the heat, the warming rays of the sun through so they warm the soil without letting any light rays through so weed growth will start. No weeds, warmer soil, warm soil, warmer roots, warmer roots, better root growth, and an awfully vigorous tomato plant. The whole idea in getting early tomato growth is to give them the optimum conditions when you set out your young little plants. My next technique for getting the earliest tomatoes is to prune the plants to one stem in order to focus as much energy as possible into setting and ripening fruit. Now, if you're gonna do this, you wanna to remember to get an indeterminate variety. Look in the seed catalog and make sure it says indeterminate variety. Those are the ones that will keep on growing and making fruit at the same time. Now, the way you do that is to take out the suckers that appear on the stem in between the leaves and the stem as they grow. Now, if they're as big as that, they're easy to see, but I like to take them out when they're much smaller, almost the size of these up here, so the plant isn't putting any energy into creating them. But when you're up here doing this, there is a sucker and it's gonna go, snap. You want to make sure that you understand which is the main stem, which is the leaf branch, and which is the growing tip of the plant. The growing tip of the plant is right behind my hand here. And if I prune that out, I will kill the whole plant. So pay very close attention. Here is the stem, here is the leaf branch, Here's the growing tip of the plant, and this is the sucker that's going to get pruned out. And I do it just with a simple snapping action, and it comes out. Now, if there is a large one like this, and I left this one here on purpose, it serves to grow me some new tomato plants to put into my fall greenhouse for fall production. If you live in a climate where you can have both a spring and a fall crop, this is a great technique. You take an early sucker like that, snap it off, and just put it in a glass of water like this as if you were trying to root any cutting. It will soon make roots. You pot it onto some soil, and then you have a bunch of nice, healthy little tomato plants that will carry your fruiting program well on into the fall. Pruning to a single stem allows me to get much more fruit in a small space because I'm growing my plants vertically. But if I'm gonna grow them vertically, I have to support them. And so the first step is to put up these wooden plant supports, which allow me to tie strings to them and then train my tomato plants up the string. Now, the best way to attach them to the string is to use one of these little plastic clips. They come with teeth on there that hold on to the string, and so when I put that on there, it won't slide down, and then I move it over and I put the tomato stem through the main hole. It's important that you put these on underneath a branch rather than underneath the fruit cluster because as the plant gets heavy it is going to rest on this to support itself and any resting to support itself underneath the fruit cluster might cut off sap flow and you get fewer or smaller fruits now you can get these clips from any tomato supply catalog but if you aren't able to get them there's another old technique that works just as well and in that case, as the plant grows, you just wind it around the string. And the friction between the string and the stem of the plant supports it. So my next step here, you can see how it's come up, is to just take carefully take the plant, bend it around like that, and now I have one more turn around the string, and this is supported for another week or so. Whichever technique you use, pruning tomato plants to one stem and training them vertically will get you earlier, better and cleaner fruit. Another popular tomato staking method is to plant them inside a cage of concrete reinforcing wire. Now this one is about 18 inches in diameter 
and where the edges came together, the wire had just been bent over to hold it like that. You can stand them upright, and it has nice large holes you can reach through and pick the fruit. Now, on this large commercial scale, these stretch off into the distance, they have attached them to a wire along here to hold them upright. What I do on the home garden scale, just drive the stake in next to them and tie them off to the stake. You don't have to do as much pruning for this as you do for the single stem method, but you have to do a little at the start. And what you do is, after you put the plant in, you prune off all the suckers at the lower part of the stem, up here that's just below the first fruit branch. From there on, you let them grow. And what that does is it keeps the lower suckers, which would grow out this way, from being out and getting in your way. The higher ones will grow up inside the cage. Now, if you grow them on the single stem, as I showed you earlier, what you get are earlier fruit and larger fruit, but fewer of them. This method gives you a lot more total yield, and it's actually a lot less work. Somehow, there's always too many tomatoes. Many more than I can eat before frost. Now, in past years, I used to can all of those, but lately I've been drying them. They take up much less space when they're stored, and they give a really delicious pungency to sauces or soups, or even put on pizza. Now, there's a number of ways to do it. If you live in a warm, dry, sunny climate, just spread them out on screens in the sunshine. That's what they do in Italy. But in our foggy main climate, it wouldn't be sun-dried tomatoes. They'd be fog-mildewed tomatoes. So I use this electric dryer. Now, if you don't have one of these, you might find you could get hold of a solar dryer or even use your oven if you can turn it down well below 200 degrees. I usually set this at 115. It could also go maybe as high as 140, but you don't want to scorch them. Just turn them on and maybe eight hours will dry those. Now, we found that the best type of tomato to grow for drying is the Italian paste type, like this La Rosa, which has done very well for us. And the simplest way to handle them is to just cut them in half like that and spread them out on your drying trays like this. That's the simplest way. But I've found an even better way is to peel the skins off first. Now, this batch was plunged into a boiling water bath for 60 seconds. And as you can see, I can now slip those skins off very easily. See this, how easily that skin just peels right off? There. Then what I do is cut it in quarters, and with my thumb, I get rid of some of the juice and pulp and lay it down there like that. It's a little more work, but it cuts your drying time in half, and that's good if you're trying to save power. That's all there is to it. Now, how do you know when they're done? Well, they shouldn't feel sticky anymore. You can dry them till they're slightly leathery and soft like this, as long as they're not sticky, especially if you want to soak them in olive oil like that. Or you can let them go to a crispier stage and then just reconstitute them when you're ready to use them by pouring a little boiling water on top. And boy, are they yummy. As a tomato lover, I am in hog heaven. Behind me is the trial ground of Johnny's selected seeds in Albion, Maine. And there are 300 different tomato varieties there for them to look at. And the selection is impressive. Now, for the average person, this is what tomatoes look like. But when you have 300 varieties, ah, now you have some choice. Here's a beautiful little one called Matt's Red Cherry. It's actually much more of a current. And look at the beautiful way they hang on the vine. Here is a large red one, doesn't even have a name yet because they haven't figured out whether it's better than what they have, but it sure looks beautiful to me. A lovely little white one called Sun and Snow, and I tasted these. This has a flavor you wouldn't believe. And even a larger one called Great White, beginning to have a little red coloring in there. If you want more of that, here is Striped German. Look at the color in there. Wouldn't slices of that be spectacular in a sandwich? Here's another one with no name. It's just called Workshop Number Two. It's a little paste tomato that they're developing, and I'd grow it just for the beauty alone. Wouldn't that look nice hanging on a plant in the garden? And a second paste tomato. No, it's not a pepper. It's a tomato. This one's called Sausage, well-named, and it's just filled with good tomato flesh for making tomato paste. Now, 
This seed house does a lot of work with heirloom varieties. And this one's called Lillian's Yellow Heirloom. I've tasted it. It's spectacular. I know darn well why Lillian has been saving that one so long. You want a pretty one? Here is Tiger Tom. Look at that lovely coloring. It's almost something you ought to frame in the kitchen and aren't even going to dare to eat. Now, here's a famous one, Prudence Purple, a nice large one, fantastic color. You cut slices of this, and it'll make a memorable platter. And you want them even larger? This is persimmon, about as spectacular a large yellow tomato as I have ever seen. And last but not least in my selection in there is brandy wine. And many people feel that this is the best tasting tomato ever grown. Hi, Barbara. I just found the most delicious yellow cherry tomatoes over there. I don't even know what they're called. <laughs> well, this is almost tomato overkill. And before I take out my knife and start slicing these and the juice starts running down my chin, I suspect it's time to say goodbye and good gardening. Next on TLC, doing something for your home can be easy, even fun. Check and see here on Homebodies. Then, add value to your home with some serious improvements. The Home Pro shows you how. Mm -hmm.